Joint Appropriations Committee, we just completed our lunch break. The time is 1.15. As mentioned before we went on break, we only have one agency left to do for our agenda items for today. And that is State Parks and Cultural Resources. Committee, that is agency number 24 in your budget books. And with that, we will turn this over to Director Dave Glenn. Welcome, Director. It's good to have you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm a little bit nervous, so bear with me. I'm a rookie here. <laughs> uh, maybe I can introduce some staff very quickly. We have Please. Deputy Director Nick Nealon from the State Park side and Sarah ne Needles, Sarah Sheen from the Cultural Resources side. And we have Karen Erickson uh, from our fiscal manager. Now, Karen, it's her birthday today. Oh. So, so our fiscal manager presenting in front of JAC, you're welcome. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, Happy also, birthday. Also some, that's probably a good idea. That's a good idea. And also we have some staff, the, the phone of friends that are behind me. Uh, we have Sarah uh, Dave Davis from the archives. We have commissioner Ken McCann, who's one of our state parks commissioners and cultural resources commissioner. We have Christine Bird. She's a district manager for this district and we've started a new mentorship program. Christina is double dipping because she is a mentor and also a mentee. She's learning about the legislative process. So you'll see a lot of Christina over the next year or so. We have Patrick Harrington here with the Outdoor Recreation Office. Kevin Rambler, the director of the museum. And I believe that's it. I might've missed some folks, but I apologize if I do. Uh, Madam Chairman, I just wanna start out with a, a hearted thank you. I've been listening to all of you since December and I listen for a couple of hours and my brain is mush. And and I listen, you you stay so focused and the work you do. So thank you for all of your efforts. Madam Chairman, if it's all right, maybe we can start out on page four with our budget summary. Happy to do so. Page four, committee. Madam Chairman, we're requesting our standard six point sixty one point six million dollar standard budget. Of that, roughly half is general funds, a third is federal funds, or of the other half, a third is federal funds, and two thirds is other funds. Uh, I'm proud to say that in our BFY 23 budget, our general fund consists of 51% of our standard budget. BFY 13, that was at 68%. So we've actually dropped off the general fund roughly about $5 million or 15% compared to where we were 12 years ago. Just for some background, we are a very diverse agency. You have the state park side with state parks, historic sites, motorized trails, non-motorized trails, and the outdoor recreation office. And then the cultural resources division is incredibly diverse in its own with the state museum, state archives, state historic preservation office, state archeologists, the Wyoming Arts Council, and the Wyoming Cultural Trust Fund. We accomplish our mission in consultation with the State Parks and Cultural Resources Commission, Trails Council, Arts Council's Board, Cultural Trust Fund Board, State Historic Records Advisory Board, and National Register of Historic Places Board. Uh, the latest economic impact studies show roughly a $651 million economic impact to local communities in Wyoming. That is only state parks and motorized trails. We've been working with UW to try to figure out the cultural resources side, but I know we're substantially farther north than that $651 million number. So on page 14, you will see that we're requesting our standard budget plus nine exception requests for $4.549 million. Roughly one, one million, one, well not roughly, exactly, $1,169,198 in general funds, $896,000 in federal funds, and 2.48 million of other funds. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, if there's no questions, I could dive in and go unit by unit very quickly through our, our budget book. Please. Great, the first unit is uh, unit 0101 on page 16. Madam Chairman, we do have one exception, Chairwoman, I apologize. We do have one exception request, and this is on page 17. This was the number two priority for our agency, one-time computer replacements. Madam Chairwoman, these one-time computer replacements are throughout this whole budget book. So in the interest of time and at your pleasure, I'd love to collapse the conversation around computer replacements and talk about all of them right now versus willy-nilly as we go through. 
Uh, we, we have shared a spreadsheet, it's in your packet, explaining each unit, the cost, and whether it's general funds or other funds. So that should be in your packet. Representative Wal or Larson. Thank you, and, and Director Glenn, are all of these 187 devices going to be used in Unit 101 or Division 100? Director? Madam Chairwoman, Representative Larson, no, they, they are throughout the whole agency. Typically, so we allocate them throughout. So are you going to attribute this whole expense to this division? Or because we'll want to see that broken down in your budget. Ma Madam Chairwoman, Representative Larson, it is broken down in the budget. We just wanted to kind of consolidate that and, and put it on one page. Uh, in that document, it talks about the page, the, the spreadsheet we sent, talks about the page number for each specific uh, exception okay. request for computers, and then talks about the total requests and whether they're general funds or other funds. Directors being efficient, is it a gold star or a silver star, Representative Larson? <laughs> Madam Chairman. He gets a gold. It's a gold star. All right, Representative Walters. Thank you, Madam Chairman. But in that same light, uh, by having it all paid for here in the Division 0101, it means that 100% of these uh, TRP costs are borne by the general fund versus having the opportunity for some of those costs to be shared with other funds, whether they, they be special revenue, federal funds, or anything else. And so the way the way it's crafted, that's the way I interpret it now. That I may not be interpreting this correctly. So, Madam Chairman? Representative I, Larson? I think if, as the way I heard you explain it, because I agreed with him, but as you look in your spreadsheet on, for example, on page 19, we would see that for Division 100, there's only 21,420 of IT requests of that total. And so we'll see that reflected through. Is that right, Kevin? Dr. Mr. Hibbard. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, you'll see those individually requested. And if you look at page 14, you'll note, prior to number two, says total TRP, 347, and it's broken down, 304 general, 42.7 others. So they have that process going throughout the budget. You, happy birthday. <laughs> You're currently going through a rite of passage. <laughs> Enjoy it. Thank you, Madam Thank Chairman. You. Uh, so yes, this is a one-time total computer replacement package request for $347,000, $347,131. This request consists of $304,333 in general funds and $42,798 in other funds. Uh, this is for all computers that need to be replaced, and it's roughly about 90% within our agency. Uh, this is based on the ETS recommendation that computers are replaced every four years, and it also upgrades software and some monitors for port compatibility. It's no new software, just upgrading the software we have. Karen, do you have anything to add on that? Madam Chairman, if there's any questions, otherwise I can... Go ahead. Great. Uh, the next unit is on page 22, and that's the Cultural Resources Administration. And outside of the computer replacement package, we have no exception requests. All right, continue. The next unit is the Wyoming State Museum on page 27. Outside of computer replacement, we do have an exception request on the bottom of page 29, capital exhibits and wayfinding. This exception request is listed as a number nine priority for our agency. We're requesting $224,820 in ongoing general funds for creation of a capital curator position to develop and manage a capital gallery to feature rotating art and exhibits for museums and galleries across Wyoming. In addition, this position would secure loans of art and artifacts for display in public spaces in the capital, administer an advisory committee for capital art and exhibits, coordinate with other state agencies, manage rotation of art in elected officials' offices, develop service contracts, and work with LSO to ensure a high quality visitor experience in the Capitol. Our agency was asked to submit this request on behalf of the Capitol Interpretive and Wayfinding Exhibits and Wayfinding Subcommittee. Governor Gordon did deny this request as submitted and approved $224,820 of other funds from the Office of Tourism. 
and I do believe there she is right there, uh, State Auditor Racine and possibly Representative Land and uh, members of the Wayfinding Committee are here to answer any questions. Madam Chair. Representative Walters. Thank you, Madam Chair. On that recommendation, and this may be for Kevin as much as anything, the governor's recommendation is from the Office of Tourism. Or is he intending it to be from the agency's fund or from the special projects fund? I believe it's the 441. It would be the agency fund. We want to stay away from the <clears throat> projects fund. That's up to you guys. Auditor Racinas, have any comments? Welcome, Auditor. Madam Chairman, thank you. Christy Racinas, State Auditor. Uh, I come to you today in my capacity as co-chairman of the Exhibit and Wayfinding Committee. Uh, my my co-chairman is Senator Bill Landon, and that committee was created by statute a couple of years ago. It consists of three uh, building commission members and three legislative members. So Senator Landon and then Representative Nicholas and Representative Sherwood happen to serve on that committee. We also have uh, numerous agency liaisons that serve on that committee and have given us expert advice from each of their disciplines, you know, education to talk about standards that we want to hit as school kids come through the Capitol. Of course, we have Kevin on there from a curation standpoint. Um, and, and again, lots, we have tourism on there as well from the tourism perspective. We've had, I think, 22 or 23 days worth of meetings over the last couple of years, just to sort of give you some idea of the work that's uh, been put in. And we still have, I'm going to say, at least a year and a half of, of meetings to go, probably. So <laughs> it's been a really, really fruitful effort. The project is going really well. Um, the reason I'm here supporting this position, and I think this committee knows I go out of my way to not ask for money if I can get away with it. So. Um, the legislature has made a substantial investment in this project. Uh, and, and and regardless of whether you agree with that investment or not, I, I think it was supported by this committee. It's been about $6 million that will go into this project to make our capital everything it should be and to really finish the project to its completion and have it be open and educational and functional and also very exciting and relevant. This effort has been interbranch. And I know that all of you know that those, whenever we come together as branches, the results are, are always good, but sometimes they're clunky. Um, you know, the legislation that puts them together uh, can be a little bit clunky and getting to an end can be a little bit clunky as it should be because we're getting input from, from all sides and making sure that no one is surprised and everyone is on board or at least knows what's coming. When this committee sunsets, we will have this $6 million investment and nothing to upkeep it. So I think this position is critical to maintain all of these static and digital exhibits and contents that we're going to be putting into this building. And again, I think it's important that that have a dedicated home. And we talked a lot about where that lives. Is State Parks the perfect place? Maybe not, but it's it's the best one we think, you know, I think my fear is that it falls to somewhere where it doesn't really belong, um, A, B, doesn't get done at all, or C, gets done poorly. So, so having this position that lives in the State Museum sort of gives a guaranteed skill set of the kind of person that's going to be dealing with um, amazing historical artifacts. Uh, the, other, the other last thing I would say is one of the things that um, has been envisioned, I, I, I don't wanna speak for the governor, but I believe he said this publicly a couple of times, is there's a lot of interest in featuring displays from other areas of the state or other museums on loan and whatnot. As you know, uh, the State Museum has done an amazing job on that Capitol Gallery 
uh, down, down in the extension. So making that really, really a display piece. So that's, that's what's been envisioned as well. Um, I'll stop there. That's plenty. And I know um, it's been a long day already. Uh, and I would just say that this position comes with full support from the subcommittee. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Auditor. Questions for the Auditor or the, on the, the subcommittee wayfinding? Representative Sherwood, Co-Chairman Nicholas, any comments as members of that committee? Thumbs up from the Co-Chairman. Double thumbs up from Representative Sherwood. All right. Thank you all. Any final comments on this topic before the director moves on? All right, director, Thank please you. continue. Thank you, auditor. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, the next unit is on page Madam 30. Chairman. Oh my goodness. Representative Walters. Moving back to, had to cover the topic they were on. Now I'm back to the next, to my question, it's, which is on page 28. The Museum Enterprise Fund it shows a declining balance over the next several bienniums and over the last few bienniums and just uh, curious your thoughts on why that showing a declining balance. So we're on page 28. Here's to be a declining balance on the Museum Enterprise Fund. Madam Chairman, we're thinking. <laughs> Go ahead. Madam Chairman, uh, one of the one of the reasons that it's gone down is we stopped running the state museum store ourselves um, and found it more cost effective to send it out to a vendor. So rather than having a full time staff person run the store and all of the proceeds come into us and then try and cover that that general fund position. Um, a few years ago, we had a vendor come in. They're running the store. We get a small percentage of the proceeds from that for their ability to be functional in our museum space. So that is some of what you're seeing there. All right, thank you, Representative. All right, Director, back to the budget presentation. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, the next unit is on page 34, the Wyoming State Archaeologist. And outside of the computer replacements, we have no exception requests for that unit. Madam Chairman, the next unit is on page 38, the Office of Wyoming State Archaeologist. Representative Larson. So, Director Glenn, could we go back to your uh, narrative on the state archaeologists on page 34 in that narrative? And it talks about outreach and education enrichment is also a primary important function. And could you just give us an example of, of how that takes place and explain that a little more, please? Madam Chairman and uh, Representative Larson, Essentially, the state archaeologist uh, invites, the biggest thing they probably do is during the, the field season in the summertime when they have projects going on, they invite um, school groups, uh, volunteers from, from any age group to come out and help on those, on those digs. Um, the staff of that program give a number of outreach programs to schools throughout the school year, too. And um, in addition to things like our archaeology fair that we hold in Laramie every single year, um, anytime we're working on a project, the public is welcome. And we do, of course, see um, every age group that you can imagine come through, and we try and educate them as best we can when we can. Uh, Director Hibbert? My apologies, Madam Chairman. Can we go back to page 28? I just want to point out an error. If you look at that revenue table, you'll see I, val I validated the current cash balance. So you'll see that the 25, 26 planning starts out with 268,000. You subtract 20 and you add 34, that should be 282. The table's broken. So in fact, the cash balance is going up a little bit. We'll get you a clean table. Representative Walters is super sharp. Yeah, That's a silver star. <laughs> All right. Director, back to you. Uh, Madam Chairman, the next unit is on page 38, the 38. Office of Wyoming State Archaeologists, the Archaeological Survey section. And outside of those computer replacements, we have no exception requests. Let's take a minute. Okay. 
Madam Chairman, the next unit is on page 42, the Wyoming Cultural Trust Fund. We do have one exception request on page 43, Cultural Trust Fund Spending Authority. This was a number seven priority for our agency. It's an ongoing request for $300,000 and other funds. You know, thanks to the legislature support, JEC support, the governor's support, the corpus of the Cultural Trust Fund has increased by close to $11.5 million in the last two years. So this spending authority request would allow us to follow statute and grant out interest on the larger corpus of $27.8 million. Sarah, do you have anything to add on that? Governor Gordon did recommend approval of this ongoing exception request. Unless there's any questions, I can keep rolling. Go ahead. Great, thank you, Madam Chairman. The next unit is the State Historic Preservation Office on page 45. And outside of computer replacements, we have no exceptions requests for that unit. Next up. Representative Larson. I'll come back to it at the end, please. Are you sure? <clears throat> We're going we're gonna to go big picture at the end. All right. Madam Chairman, the, the next unit is on page 49, the Wyoming Arts Council. And outside of computer replacements, we do have one exception request on page 51. This is listed as agency priority number eight, Arts Council Federal Spending Authority and Matching Funds. The agency is requesting $600,000, 300 of which is ongoing general funds, 300,000 of which, which is additional spending authority of federal funds. So in the past, past few years, the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, has increased our contribution to the annual partnership grants to the Wyoming Arts Council. For the most part, as you know, these grants go to, towards communities, local governments, NGOs, tribes, and individual Wyoming artists. The, these grants do require one-to-one -one state general fund match. Over the past few years, as these NEA grants have grown, we've historically requested spending authority through the B11 process, and we just wanna be more transparent uh, and straight up and make this request up front. The NEA is projecting that grants will be increasing. And the, the one thing I wanna say too, additionally, is that if this general funding is approved, it will only be allocated for this one-to-one -one match. If, if that one-to-one -one match does not happen, it will go right back into the general fund. The governor did recommend approval of this ongoing exception request. Madam Chairwoman, if there's any questions. Good by me. I'm all right with that. Uh, the next unit, Madam Chairman, is on page 55, the Wyoming State Archives. And outside of computer replacements, we do have one exception request in this unit. This is on page 57 and was the agency's number four priority for State Imaging Center equipment and maintenance. Madam Chairman, this, this is a request for $170,545 in general funds. It's listed as 99,955 for one-time request for equipment and 70,590 and ongoing. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, this is a mistake. And that, that was on me, that's on us. It should be the whole $170,545 is a one-time exception request. As we dug into this more yesterday evening, uh, I found out that those uh, maintenance agreements contracts last five years and not every biennium. So this we're asking for the one-time jump up front We'll come back, if, that, if approved, we'll come back to you in five years and ask for an increase for uh, adding to those maintenance agreements. Uh, this request is for six high-speed rotary scanners and one high-speed microfilm scanner, plus maintenance agreements for this equipment. So as you're aware, our agency provides enterprise digitization, I have a hard time saying that word, services to generally funded state agencies. These agencies are required by statutes and regulations to maintain documents and provide access to these documents. So this is flat out customer service on our end. Uh, if you haven't been to the third floor of the Barrett building, those scanners are in use all day, every day, as we're taking documents from other agencies and digitizing them. Uh, the current models we have are slowly dying. Last time the maintenance guy came out, he said that you need to do something because we can't maintain them. We don't have parts, et cetera. Uh, the equipment is all 10 to 11 years old. Uh, purchase of this equipment and agreements will ensure that, it, that we can continue to support generally funded state agencies. Sarah, anything else? Governor Gordon did recommend approval of this request as submitted. 
Director Hibbard. Madam Chairman, thank you. Archives and records are a source of administrative cost that is cleared through the statewide cost allocation. That is cleared to agencies predicated on how many square feet they occupied of the total square foot that is occupied. So this is a cost allocation source, meaning that you're gonna recover it through federal funds or special revenue dollars. Thank you, very helpful. So Madam Co-Chair. Yeah. So, so are we eliminating the maintenance agreements line, line 70, so if you're only asking for 99 versus 170? Madam, Madam Chairwoman, Representative Nicholas, it is the total 175.45. The way these maintenance agreements work, it's like a warranty that you buy on your car. You've got to pay for it up front. Uh, that lasts for five years. Well, that's a five-year warranty on, on five top of their mandatory one-year warranty. So really, it's a four-year warranty. Madam Chairwoman, Representative Nicholas, correct. Director Hibbard. Madam Chair, normally uh, 292 would be an ongoing, 242 would be a one-time but the agency has requested that this become all one time, the full 170, 545, one time. Yes, the 242 naturally is a one time and the 292 typically is ongoing. But in this case, the agency is just asking that this entire request be one time. Okay, Thank you. got it, go ahead. All right, moving on, Madam Chairman, Chairwoman. Uh, the next unit is on page 61, Digital Records Repository. And we do have two exception requests in this unit. Uh, the first request is on page digital, page 62, Digital Archives, Licenses, and Maintenance. This is the agency's third priority. So we're requesting $94,500 in general funds, of which 65,000 is a one-time request for software, at 29.5 thousand, which is an ongoing request for maintenance agreements for this software. This is about our agency trying to provide good customer service and support for other state agencies, local governments, and municipalities. So these agencies are required to maintain documents for a specific amount of time based on records retention schedules. These licenses are necessary to allow access to digital archives to ensure records are available as required by Wyoming state statutes. But in addition to that, it's not that they can only access it, they can also upload. So in the past, we've gotten big boxes of CDs plopped in the archives and say, can you help us upload this information? Now, Sarah and her team are actually working to train those folks so they can upload that data themselves. Uh, so we're excited that these additional agencies are taking advantage of the digital archives. There's cost savings and there's definitely security benefits to it. Right now we have 134 licenses for users and all but 11 are assigned. Uh, the other 11 will be gone within a month or two. Uh, so this request purchases 100 new licenses and ongoing maintenance agreements to provide more agencies, local governments, and municipalities with access to the digital archives. And obviously we'll work through ETS to ensure we get the absolute best deal possible. On this. Representative Larson. Thank you. Could you help me understand the difference or, or the correlation between your unit 240 and, and 249? You, you got the digital records repository and then the archives. And is, I, I would assume that there's some correlation there, Sarah. Ms. Erickson. Madam Chair, I'm going to defer to Sarah actually to explain the difference between the archives and their subsection of the unit of the digital or the digital repository. It's kind of all comes together. But... Find your time, Sarah. Madam Chairman, uh, the difference really is that uh, in the State Imaging Center, what we're requesting is scanning equipment. That means we are physically scanning documents in. I know the difference between the requests. I'm just trying to understand the function of those two okay. units. Yes, so so ultimately they, they function in tandem. Okay. Ultimately, um, all of this information hopefully is gonna end up in a place where uh, it can be used by both agencies, um, you know, and those are of course protected for agency use, but also there's things that go in that are things like permanent records that are historical in nature that will be available to the public. 
Um, so they really go hand in hand. There's not a lot of difference. They just end up, they all end up in, in some sort of a digital format that's usable by state agencies, municipalities, local governments, and the public. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chairman, the second digital archives request is agency priority number six on page 63, uh, digital wet archives web drawer upgrade. This is a $75,000 one-time general fund request. Uh, again, this is a customer service piece for, for us. The web drawer is for agencies, local governments, municipalities, and the public to easier access specific digital data. Uh, Ma Madam Chairwoman, it's, it's almost like a Google search. Uh, this fall, I, I love Kennetrek hunting boots, and I got on a local website, uh, which is a store here, there's one in Casper, and I punched in Kennetrek hunting boots, and the first thing that came up was a pair of waders, and then after that came up a vest and then a jacket. Just for fun, I kind of tracked myself through it. I think it was page 14, where the Kennetrek hunting boots that I was looking for is where I found them. Uh, so right now we have a service, but we can't even share it because it's just like that that's sporting good warehouse when uh, it just doesn't work. So these funds would support a customized and improved functionality, and it'll provide a service through ease of access for all users and better get them access to open records. Uh, Madam Chairman, Governor Gordon did recommend approval of this one time request as submitted. Sarah, do you have anything to, to add? Hi, everybody's good. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Next up is Unit 0401, Parks Administration on page 67, and we have no exception requests for this unit. After that is Unit 404, and that is on page 71, Land and Water Conservation Funds, uh, and we have no exception requests for this unit as well. After that is Motorboat Gas Tax 0411 on page 73, and we have no re exception requests for this unit. Moving along, Madam, Madam Chairman. Chair. Madam Chair, may we go back just slightly with the question? Going back to page 71, the Land and Water Conservation Fund uh, funds are used to match with state funds to do things with public facilities. Just before lunch, we had a discussion about the Arboretum. Could these funds be used to help purchase that in conjunction with state funds? <clears throat> Director? Madam Chairwoman, uh, Representative Walters, I believe they could. Uh, I, I, it could be for the purchase or it could be for some specific projects that are that are on the ground there as well. There are some, as you know, some stipulations with LWCF dollars that has to forever be in, in a public space and, and other things. But there may be some opportunities to have discussions about that for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Right, go ahead, Director. Madam Chairman, next up is Unit 420, the Motorized Trails Program on page 77. Outside of computer replacements, we do have one exception request on page 79. And this was the agency's number one priority, trails program equipment replacement. We're asking for $2.249 million of other fund spending authority to replace trails equipment. $916,200 of that would come from the SNOW account, $736,800 from the ORV account, and $596,000 in federal funds. These SNOW and ORV funds come directly from user fees, those people that buy the stickers to, to use our trails, or from gas taxes paid on OHV and snowmobile fuel. Uh, historically, the motorized trails program has used the standard budget to purchase roughly the same amount of equipment per biennium. Uh, at the beginning of BFY 21, Director Hibbard reminded us that, that we're, we were made aware that per statute, we can't do that. Uh, and we need to actually ask for an exception request. So on page 83, you'll see that we dropped the standard 200 series budget by $1.5 million and we're adding this equipment exception request. Now, cutting 1.5 and then asking for 2.249 million is not a wash, and, and I understand that. But these purchases vary from biennium to biennium, mainly depending on weather and snow years and, and how those work. Uh, so this type of equipment request will be common with the Motorized Trails Program every biennium. Madam Chairwoman, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer, and otherwise you can rock and roll. Let's rock and roll. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, 
Next up is the Office of Outdoor Recreation on page 85. Uh, outside of computer replaces, we have no exception requests for the Office of Outdoor Recreation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Representative Larson. So, could you, miss, Mr. Director, Dave, could you help me? We we have outdoor recreation, which is 0425, and then you have the Office of Outdoor Recreation, which is in the governor's office, but you administer it. Is is that 0425 or? Uh, Madam Chair, Chairwoman, Representative Larson, Larson, I'm not sure about in the governor's office. The, the Office of Outdoor Recreation sits within State Parks and Cultural Resources in 0425. Uh, there are some other funds that we use. Uh, some of those were uh, what Director Schober was talking about, 0426 for some very specific positions and other things. But but 0425 does sit within, within our agency. I'll follow up with you. Okay, thank you, sir. Oh, Madam Chairman, you know, it's the Office of Outdoor Recreation is in the governor's office. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, Representative Larson, uh, the Outdoor Recreation Office and Office of Outdoor Recreation are one of the same. We just call them by different names at different times, and that is within state parks. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Anderson. Madam Chairman, I'm back on oh, page 80. You've got a trails program equipment. Uh, you got a snow cat there. Where, where do, where's that park that they would be grooming the trails? <clears throat> where's the snow cat? Matt, Madam Chairman, Senator Anderson, I didn't quite hear that question. Can, can you repeat that, please? He's on page 80. Senator Anderson is looking at page 80, and he is curious to know the location of the snow cat to, to what, groom some trails. Trails, what trail are they grooming it? One snow cat, I mean, it can't groom too many. Uh, Madam Chairman, Senator Anderson, we have about 16 snow cats throughout the state. So an example is there's four in the snowy range, three that are owned by the state, one that is owned by a contractor. We have them in the Bighorns. We have them outside of Sundance in the Black Hills, Togety, Wyoming Range. They're, they're located in all kinds of different locations. Okay. okay. We'll need those and the fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> And Madam Chairman, Senator Anderson, if you're ever over to Lander at our trails building, stop by and we'll teach you how to drive one. It's kind of fun. So. <laughs> All right. Also, thank, you. thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chairman, next up is uh, park operations on page 89. Uh, and outside of computer replacements, we have no exception requests for this unit. Madam Chairman, last up is page nine, Chairwoman, I apologize, is page 96, Parks Special Revenue. And we do have one exception request on page 98. This is agency priority number five, State Parks Heavy Equipment Replacement. This request is for spending authority from State Parks account, other funds to purchase $480,000 worth of heavy equipment. <laughs> Depending on revenues, our goal will be to request roughly about $500,000 worth of equipment for the next two to three bienniums. As you can see, we're replacing equipment that is 28 to 45 years old. We can't find parts for the equipment. It's continually breaking down. And there's also a safety factor for our employees. Some of the equipment we are using is actually Vietnam War era surplus. Uh, staff spent a lot of time repairing equipment and sometimes even fabricating parts. And we think this will greatly increase efficiencies, customer service, safety, and decrease downtime. Uh, Nick, do you have anything to add on that? And Governor Gordon did approve this one time other fund request. Representative Walters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, have you talked to or worked with YDOT at all to try and use some of their bulk purchasing opportunities to buy some of this equipment? And then even Senator Anderson would have good information on the ability for the for go government to get a better rate than, than the general public does. Uh, so I didn't know if you'd inquired about any of those options or opportunities. Madam Chairman, Representative Walters, that's a that's a great point, and we should do that. I, you know, initially when we were looking at those buybacks, we were working with YDOT and other companies on that, uh, but we have not had conversations with them. Even usually, the requests that we put forward, we're usually buying used equipment. We're buying something that's got you know maybe eight hundred to a thousand hours on it to to just get a little bit better bang for the buck. 
but that's a great point and, and we will take that into advisement for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Madam Chairman, that, that's the budget in a nutshell. I'd stand for any questions. Gold Star, Representative Sherwood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for the presentation and the good work that your agency is doing. Um, I am curious on the status, um, or I guess why there's not an exception request for the We the People program, which I got to participate in this year and it was amazing. Um, and then the Wyoming Humanities is one of your partners. Thank you. Madam Chair and Representative Sherwood, um, the simple answer to that is the governor's um, uh, budget recommendations from 2020 actually outlined, um, I'm, I'm gonna sort of paraphrase what he, what he wrote in here, is that um, the Humanities Council uh, programs and We the People, and there's several others that he mentions, um, they fall outside of the normal scope of state government. Um, but the state has supported those in the past. We've been a pass through in our budget for those programs in the past. Um, he stated that these programs have merit, but should be able to stand on their own merits. And so for the last few biennium, we have not requested funds as a pass-through for these programs for that very reason. Follow-up, Representative Sherwood. Thank you. It's my understanding, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, that the Wyoming Humanities gets um, federal funds and that those are supposed to be matched by state funds. Is that a correct assumption. Madam Chair, I am uh, do not speak as an expert on the humanities, but I believe that is true. Representative Walters? No, Representative Larson. Director Glenn, as I was reading your native at the, at the beginning in preparation, there's a note on ours council and, and those various boards, the number of boards that you work with. But if I, so I'm saying who's who, who are those? And I go to your website, I can't find them. And so yep, it's your website, but as people learn more about your agency, it might be a, a thought to consider those boards that you're working with and who's on them is, is, is helpful for us to better understand how they interact with you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Walters. Madam Chair, this committee would just not enjoy the rest of the day if I didn't ask this question. Your remote work policy for the at least the employees operating here in your main Cheyenne office. Snowcat and members. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And actually, I made some notes on that because I have been listening to the AAC. Uh, so uh, our whole business model is about working. That's what we do. Uh, and we have a lot of experience doing it. Uh, there's, a, of course, a lot of positions that need to stay in the office for customer service uh, to the public and other agencies. But we've le leaned in to the telework policy. Uh, and this isn't specifically around Cheyenne, but an example is I have a superstar that works out of Grable. And if she had to work in an office, we would not have the su superstar employee uh, if she was required to work there. Having said this, we watch it really closely. I have denied telework requests. I have revoked telework requests and telework agreements based on employee performance. Uh, last year, I believe the turnover rate for state agencies was roughly about 18 and percent. We were just over 9%. And I think part of that is due to the much appreciated pay increases. Uh, and also it's a positive culture of our agency, but the ability to give opportunity for flexible work schedules and to telework plays highly into that. And I can't emphasize enough, especially the flexible work schedules uh, for folks. Uh, Representative Walters, does that answer your question? Great. Representative Stead. Madam Chairman, uh, Director Glenn, I, on the Wyoming Trails program, I noticed in the narrative that you note that 98% of the 8,921 miles of recreational trails in Wyoming are located on federal lands. So the question, is, and then you have you don't manage those lands directly, obviously, but you coordinate with that. But my question is, if the federal government through the United States Bureau of Land Management were to adopt their preferred alternative B for the Rock Springs area, um, as opposed to the status quo alternative A, how would that affect, if anything, how you do your job with respect to the trails? Uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Representative Stith, that's a great question. And, and I, 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 I'm I not going to an answer that question very well. Our trails program manager, Forrest Kaminga, could answer that 
much better. What we do know is that the majority of BLM roads and two tracks are considered uh, routes uh, on motorized trail routes. What that means is you have to buy that sticker uh, to, to be able to use those if you don't have a license plate on your vehicle. Uh, so if you're cutting down the number of roads that people can access and people can use, we're gonna have less sticker sales on those types of things. It also uh, doesn't allow the BLM to request dollars because that's part of the partnership we have with federal agencies is that they can actually come to us for grants to do maintenance on trails and to do other things. So it wouldn't allow them to be able to do that. Having said that, we don't work that much with the BLM on the motorized trails piece. It's the majority of it's on the Forest Service up in the mountains. Senator Kinski. So let me go back to Representative Sherwood's inquiry. I, and maybe staff can correct me, I thought We the People was in the last biennial budget. It was, okay. So it's just this biennial budget, the instruction is to cut it out. Mr. Richards? Uh, Madam Chairman, Senator Kinski, it was in last year's budget as a footnote, and it is not at all in their request. Okay, uh, Madam Chair, uh, was, that in the, was that in the department's request last year, or did that come from the legislature? Madam Chairman, Senator Kinski, it came from the legislature. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Representative Sherwood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is, I'm gonna prod a little bragging on behalf of the department um, and put Mrs. Bird on the spot. I have heard that there is good news concerning the Quebec site and I'm wondering if that time is right to share that good news with us. Yes? <laughs> All right, good news, Q1. Welcome, if you'd introduce yourself to the committee and share with us your news. Good afternoon, my name is Christina Bird. I'm a district manager for Wyoming State Parks, Historic Sites and Trails, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Sherwood, uh, members of the JAC. I am thrilled to announce and bring news to you that the Quebec One Missile Alert Facility has received a National Park Service designation within the Secretary of Interior's office as a National Historic Landmark. Wow. Congratulations. Gold stars everywhere. Thank you so much for sharing. All right, any additional questions, comments from the committee? Just give it a minute, just give it a minute. I'm Senator Anderson. Comment, uh, <clears throat> somebody brought up uh, bulk discounts on machinery for our government agencies and don't get your motor all revved up about that. There aren't any. <laughs> but what there is is a government rate, and what you have to do as a manufacturer is pull all the taxes off of it right back to where the taconite was made. So you pull all the taxes out, and that's the rate you pay on that piece of equipment. And it usually cuts it 40% or so. So you'll find, and I see your list of equipment, you're going to find it they're a lot cheaper than what the contractor buys them for. And some of us made a business out of that. Uh, it, was, it was real good. We'd guarantee the machine for three years and take it back and we'd have a machine we could still sell. So you'll get the government rate that is incredible, just incredible, because taxes are pulled out. Inside Thank baseball you. right there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Anderson. All right, final questions before we depart with the agency. Thanks for all your work, excellent job. Okay, with that committee, we're gonna go to Speaker Summers. He's right there in the corner. Yeah. Give it a minute. Just a couple minutes to stretch your legs, everybody, but we'll let the committee clear and Speaker Summers will hit the deck. Okay. Okay, and then Somers has to get out of here.
Yeah. All right, committee, we'll come back to order. And I see we have in front of us the Speaker of the House, Representative Summers. Welcome, Speaker Summers. It's good to have you here with us. We have in front of us a bill draft, 24 LSO 353, working draft point four. Committee members, that was placed on your desks earlier today. I think Speaker Summers is going to walk us through this bill draft, starting with kind of the reason why it's in front of us and his ideas for it. And then we'll talk about what the bill actually does. So Speaker Summers, um, the floor is yours. Madam Chairman, um, Mr. Co-Chair, fellow committee members, thanks for, uh, thanks for hearing me out. So as you folks know from the last budget, well, from the ARPA budget, you appropriated $25 million to help match um, the bead program that was coming out of the infrastructure, I think it was the Infrastructure Act, but uh, basically the bead program for broadband development. Um, as, as that played out, you know, originally we were thinking, well, at a minimum, Wyoming might get 100 million. So Wyoming now is, basically set to get $347, $48 million. Um, you subtract stuff out of that, you know, maybe we're down to $268 million, and maybe we need a 25% match of that would be $67 million. I'm not saying we need to do that because it's clear in the ranking system that the federal government created that they wanted providers to... Um, the more you, the provider matched, the higher up the ranking system they went. So ARPA was set aside to, to do the to match. The timelines, we don't know right now, and this is my understanding, maybe we do, but my understanding, we don't know right now whether the ARPA timeline is going to mesh with the bead timeline and whether the 25 million um, will be be available for matching or not. I think that's an open question, and I'll let the gentleman to my left talk about that. But then come back to, to the bill. When Endow was first created, when the Endow bills came out in Governor Meade's tenure, um, one of those bills was the broadband, was a broadband bill that set up a council and it set up a grant program and it isolated $10 million to, to future a future grant program. And it originally it actually allowed for some admin, I think, out of that 10 million. I forget what the how the how much it was. It wasn't a lot. And uh, and so then the the grant program was set up, established, created all the, the different connections. It was a public-private partnership. The grant program's never been used. So the 10 million is now 11 million and it sits there in an isolated coffee can. So the idea behind this bill is to simply engage that money in any, in any future uh, federal matches that we may need that for, of which could be the bead program. So it's fairly simple. It's just trying to uh, make that 10 million more usable in today's environment for broadband with all the federal money out there, the, the game in town right now is matches. So, Madam Chairman, that's what it is. I I think the gentleman to my left here could maybe go through a, a little bit more detail what I was talking about, and I, he knows a heck of a lot more about it. Gentleman to the left, you can introduce yourself to the committee. Madam Co-Chair. Thank you, David Johnson. I was hired by the Business Council in June of 21 to- Senator Garou. If you could pull your mic closer, please. Thank you. Sure. I was hired by the Business Council in June of 21 to help them through the infrastructure um, money that the state received from the federal government, both the Treasury ARPA program and this BEAD IIJA program. Uh, as the infrastructure expert, I've worked with um, the folks throughout industry in the state to establish the program. We just completed the ARPA awards. 
One concern from the providers is really the amount of match that is coming down in the BEAD program because of the funds that they've allocated, not only to the ARPA program, but what they do on their own from a infrastructure investment perspective. As you can imagine in Wyoming, um, with the distance and density challenges that we have, uh, projects are very expensive in the state. So one of the things that we're looking to do with the bead uh, funding and the match that has been designated, the 25 million in ARPA 602 funds, and with um, Speaker Summers' help, the 10 million in the original um, Senate File 100 bill is to utilize those funds to help uh, meet the match requirements of the BEAD program. And as you can see from the document in front of you, really that 25% match would amount to about $67 million. So there will be still a significant provider contribution to these uh, projects. As far as the 25 million goes, um, the governor has sent a letter to Treasury because those funds have to be obligated by December 31st of 2024. Um, the question in front of Treasury is, is can that $25 million, as we've obligated it for a bead match, does that meet the requirement? Or does there have to be some other obligation within the bead program of those funds for the state to, to be able to retain those funds under that program? So, um, uh, Madam Chair, I hope that answers the question and helps uh, Mr. Summers's position on the bill. Well, thank you. Coach Chairman Nicholas? Thank you. Chair, I do have a question. So this $25 million we're talking about, is I presume that that's the same $25 million that has been... Are, are those the, the ARPA dollars that we haven't been able to expend... And so on, on and I, Kevin's not here, but I presume that they are as part of that total 60 million of reversions that it looks like that we need to reappropriate or reallocate by um, 12, 31, 24. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is correct, yes. And I, and I asked that question just because we're working on allocations for those dollars in this committee and we'll in a bill or a, a budget concept will come out. So if we have alternative ways to, to expend that 25 million um, on broadband versus that what we're doing in our bills, we need to co cross coordinate our act, our um, our activities to to prioritize out of the two and, and to make sure that at least one of them works. Madam Chairman. Mr. Speaker. Madam Chairman, thank you. Um, I've got to believe, you know, of course, you never know with the federal government, but because they made it very clear in the ARPA account that you could use it for the match, you know, or in the bead, in the bead program that you could use the ARPA match, I can't believe then they're going to turn around and not allow the ARPA match, right? And, they're, and everybody's going to be in the same boat. Nobody's, they, the, how they roll a program out is going to affect every state. So in my opinion, you know, I think that 25 million will be able to be used, but we don't know that. And so the idea here is also is we got 10 million, we know we can allocate. Representative Larson. Thank you. I, I need a little refresher course on the ARPA dollars because there was two pots. Mm -hmm. And you referenced this 25 million is in 602 which I think was dedicated for broadband. And that's why that went there. And so if we pulled that back and we're going to expand it otherwise, it would still have to be a broadband type allocation. Is that correct? Or am I misunderstanding that? Anyone who can answer? Um, I'm Madam Chairman. Sure. I'm sure Don would be the best one. There were two pots. One was broadband dollars, and that was a, about a $70 million deal, I believe. And this other $25 million was out of the greater pot of money. And uh, actually, it was in, if my memory serves me correct, about two different motions. $15 million is bound up under one language or was, and then $10 million under another. But I could be wrong on all that. Mr. Richards? 
Madam Chair, uh, the speaker said it exactly correct. So the $25 in total that we're speaking about here is uh, not the restricted dollars or good. Just so we're clear. So it could be used in. Questions for the speaker? So Madam Chairman, I just walk you briefly through the bill if that would be your pleasure. Please do. Madam Chairman, um, you look at the bill, we'll go into 912-1404, which is basically economic diversification account created. <clears throat> and when you go into that um, in subsection A, Romanet 2, was really the development of the broadband account. So there's a sub account with this 11 million sitting in it now because of the interest that has been drawn. And as uh, you can see, originally, the only way that could be spent was provide funding for agreements entered to into, into uh, statutes 912-1501 through 1510. And if you go into the statute book, that is that grant program. So that would make a subsection A and how you could spend it that way. And then it would also go in on page three of the bill and say you could also spend that money to provide the state share of any matching funds required for the state to receive federal funds under any federal broadband program, including but not limited to the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program established by the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And then C, and this was at the uh, request of the, of the Wyoming Business Council, pay the reasonable administrative expenses of the Wyoming Business Council and about not to exceed. And, uh, and so they've got administrative costs in these programs now. Um, and I said I would put this in there and let them have that discussion with you all if you took up that bill on what you may or may wa not want to utilize for admin. So, Madam Chairman, that's basically the bill. So for clarity, Mr. Speaker, and I, this has already been established, but I just want to provide big picture clarity to the public and some members of the committee. These are not new dollars, correct? No, these dollars were allocated in when the endow program came in and and I'm sure Don has that year but it was the it was the the year Mead and Gordon switched offices when Mead went out and Gordon came in that's when those broadband uh that's when that whole account was created so that's you know we're working on what six years five years yeah so that's how long that money's been sitting it's not general fund money it it's just a pot of money that can't be pilfered unless you write a bill on it, I think. Well, it was originally that or Lizra. I think it was a Lizra spend. Yeah, I don't think that there's clarity on the source of the funds, but it's been appropriated now for a long time. Yep. And it hasn't been utilized. And so the money is just sitting there for purposes of broadband. And you're hoping to allow us to leverage these funds in connection with the federal funds for matching and then deployment. Is that correct? That is correct. That's so there's no, there is no new appropriation. That is, that is correct. Okay. Representative Walters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Speaker Summers on page three, line 10, the, the whole administration of these funds conversation that's in your bill, there's a blank trying to determine, <laughs> as opposed to a fixed dollar figure, a percentage of that, would that work? And would you think a 1% uh, per year be an adequate administrative fee to take from this? trying to maximize the dollars on the ground and limit the administrative fees. Madam Chairman. Mm -hmm, Mr. Speaker. Um, Representative Walters, you know, I'm going to let that conversation happen between you and the agency. I don't know what a reasonable amount is. I don't know all of what they want. I just said I would put that in the bill and let them have that discussion with you. All right, additional questions for Speaker Summers. Madam Chairman, I believe you, we could ask that question of the agency. We'll, and, we'll and, do that. Okay, all right. Anything left for Speaker Summers? And I'll take it out to the agency. So I see the Business Council is here. Welcome, please come forward. Welcome. 
If you could introduce yourself to the committee. Madam Chair, thank you very much, members of the committee. I'm Amy Grenfell. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Business Council. Um, as far as administrative expenses go, um, one option maybe to consider would be um, looking specifically at just the interest that has been accrued on the account to make that available for administrative use. Um, um, I believe 1% of the, the currently 10 million would be $100,000 per year. Um, 300,000 or 3% th or might be a little bit more usable for us um, given the expenses that we are seeing on the administrative side. Questions for Ms. Grenfell? Representative Larson? Amy, so are you able to use any of the IIJA funds for administrative purposes? And couldn't we use those instead of using the, the general fund dollars? Yeah, Ms. Madam. Grenfell? Yep. Madam Chair, Representative Larson, great question. So we have had administrative funds come from both the, the CPF program or ARPA 604 for broadband, as well as from the BEAD program. We do have access to some administrative expenses. Um, as far as the BEAD program, we, that has come in two different tranches from an administrative side. Our first tranche has already been fully expended. Um, we're waiting for the second tranche to be released. Access to additional administrative funds that don't have the federal um, um, additional strings attached with both of those programs would be helpful because some of the work that we're needing to do crosses over between both of the programs and for general um, administration of the broadband program. And so the ARPA 604 CPF program administrative funds can only be used for the CPF program administration. Same with the BEAD program. Um, we've had numerous expenses related to things like mapping, which would benefit both programs. We've also had um, administrative expenses related to the development of digital applications for these programs and some of the technology um, behind those as well. Representative Stiff. Madam Chairman, or Ms. Grenfell or Speaker Summers or the man to the left. Uh, well, the, um, so because we've got this $11 million that it, it does make a lot of sense to use as matching funding for the BEAD program, but we don't know that the Section 602 ARPA money, the $25 million, whether that's we're going to be able to use it at all. Does it make the most sense to then not spend the $25 million of Section, 6, Section 602 ARPA money on broadband, but to rather spend it to some other eligible ARPA use? Ms. Grenfell, or the speaker, or anyone who wants to answer. Madam Co-Chair, thank you. A, a great question. I, I would just say that those that $25 million is significant to the providers as far as the match goes. As I stated, um, there are some concerns because of the outlay. This 10 million and the ability for the business council to use it towards administrative funds will help us keep the B dollars in infrastructure rather than administration. So I think there is a benefit to the citizens of Wyoming in, in doing so. Madam Chairman. Mr. Speaker. Madam Chairman, you know, I think, I really believe we ought to leave the 25 million as long as we can and find out if we get an answer to our letter. I mean, we've got it before on guidance. I mean, they've got it, they put out guidance quite a little bit. So I think it's, I think it's worth keeping that. The, the one thing I, Madam Chairman, that I would like to ask, or, you know, perhaps Amy is, you know, what, so how much has the Wyoming Business Council, so you've got administrative dollars out of these federal funds. Has the agency itself had to eat some of the cost of broadband administration in within its own within its own setup versus, or have you been able to use all uh, federal dollars? So are you eating up your own dollars on admin? Ms. Grenfell. Madam Chair, Speaker Summers. Um, so yes, we have had to use some of the business council funding. Um, Speaker Summers, you mentioned earlier that there was administrative expenses as part of the endow money that was established for broadband. That was approximately $350,000 and that was done in the 2018 legislative session, I believe. And so those funds are very nearly expended. Um, and then um, and then we've, at, we've, we've actually had to use some additional funds as far as that software development. We use Salesforce as our system of record and that's where we're building our digital applications, and we have used our own funds to fund some of that development work. So, Madam Co-Chair. Mr. Co-Chairman, and then we're going to go to Representative Larson. So my, my thought is that 
we're talking about things that are that will all be resolved between now and session. And none of it will be resolved here today. The only issue we have now is this bill on freeing up the 10 million. So I'd like to limit our discussions just to the bill and whether or not this committee has interest in sponsoring a bill, because we're the only um, committee now left that we can get a bill numbered between now and session. Um, and, and so we're here at the behest of the speaker just to see if we can, the joint appropriations will sponsor this bill. How we work out ARPA, I mean, we've got a working group in, in, the, in the JAC working on that, and we're gonna come up and we're working with the chief executive um, branch so that we're gonna have our wish list, we have their wish list, and that then there'll be a drop dead date. We don't know what that it is. It'll be maybe August 1st or September 1st. If we don't have guidance and we don't know what we can do, okay. then we'll have a back fallout. We're um, probably most likely either corrections or Department of Health where we know we can expend the money and and put it in. But all that will, will be ironed out. I'd like to just kind of go back. Are we interested in doing this bill because It'd be nice to free up this 10 million for whatever reason. And it doesn't even have to be for broadband, but it allows us to, to for just general matching dollars so that we capitalize on this particular project. Hopefully it's broadband, but if it's not, we need to pass the bill anyway. So a couple of things. We have to hear public comment before this committee votes on the bill and just kind of work it like a traditional bill Correct. to do that. So we do just need to take a deep breath and sit back and get comfortable. We've got some time. I know we're going to be done early, so we have that benefit, but we do need to substantively work it. But the co-chairman is correct in that there'll be an opportunity to for the House Appropriations Committee, uh, if it approves introduction and then gets through, to work this bill and some of those details when we have more information about how some of those matching federal dollars may work. So we have the Business Council, the agency who's also affected by this bill, uh, who's providing testimony on it. Further questions of the Business Council? Representative Sherwood? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairwoman. Um, out of curiosity, um, can you give us an update on like how many providers do you work with? How many are based here in Wyoming or regional? And just an overview on that. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Sherwood, excellent question. I will reference the ARPA CPF program that we just awarded the $70.5 million in funding to. Uh, there were 16 providers that applied for those funds. And of those providers, all of them except one does business in Wyoming today. Questions for the Business Council concerning this bill draft? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Any other agency comment? Any public comment? Seeing none. Madam Chair. Representative Summers, any final comments before we close your participation on this bill draft and the public's participation on this bill draft? M Madam Chairman, just the, the reason I brought it to this committee is this committee's been dealing with all of the broadband money it made the most sense. And because it's an isolated pot of money is the reason I brought it here. All right, thank you. With that, public comment is closed. Committee, back to you. Is there a motion on the bill draft? Move the bill. It's been moved by Representative Larson, seconded by Senator Carew. Discussion on the bill? Oh, Chairman. Representative Larson? I'd like to move it as a JAC bill. That's all we can do here today. Yeah. So it that is the motion. Discussion on the motion? Madam Chair. Representative Walters. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I would like to make an amendment. An on, amendment from Representative Walters. On page three, line 10. <laughs> to fill in the blank with $300,000. So instead of X number of dollars, it would be 300,000. And then to delete the per year. So they would have a fixed okay. amount of administrative cost of 300,000 for administering this amount of money. Is there, did everyone hear the motion? Second. Could you repeat? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll repeat it. Line 10 on page three, filling in the blank where the X's are with 300,000 and then deleting at the end of that line per year. So it would an amount not to exceed 300,000. 
It's mm -hmm. been seconded by Representative Stith. Discussion on Representative Walter's motion. Does everyone understand the motion? Madam Chairman, Anderson? Madam Chairman, why would we eliminate per year? I I kind of like having it per year. Maybe not three hundred thousand, but wouldn't you want to? You're saying forever they could only go, go three hundred thousand ten years, Madam Chair. Representative Walters. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am. This is the administrative cost that the Business Council could uh, garner through this pot of money. My goal with this pot of money is to get these projects out on the ground and not have it be uh, swept up by an agency that we will be giving about five and a half million a year to in their in their personnel budget of their financial uh, administrative budget already in general funds. This is general fund dollars that they would just be taking another crack at general fund dollars by calling it administrative fees. I feel we fund the agency well that we'll be administering this with general fund dollars. So the general fund component would only be 300000 out of this pot of money for administrative fees. That's my ra ra rationale here. Further discussion on the motion? Senator Guru? Question for the Springer. So I'm going to make sure I understood. I heard it right. So $300,000 and we strike per year. And so your idea is, your reasoning is, we're going to get the money out on the street and that the business council is free to come back in a, in a subsequent session and ask for more money in their budget or administrative work that could be at a later time for this or anything else. But for right now, for this money, the intent and your motion is to get this money out of the street and this money, 300000 to go for administration. Right? Correct? I'm Senator Walters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Responding to the question, that is correct. Thank you. Further discussion on Representative Walters' motion concerning the administrative fee. Question having been called, all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? No. That, that amendment has passed. Further amendments on the bill? Question on the bill. Uh, Representative Sherwood. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is probably my English nerd coming out. Um, on page two, line six, um, we use the phrase endow, which I am a huge fan of, but for colleagues who may not know what that stands for, I think we should spell it out as it can be interpreted as an acronym. No, no, uh, I'll ask, I'll just go to LSO. Yeah, what is the standard for um, existing LSO? Uh, it is existing language, but but I think Representative Sherwood may just want to clean up maybe antiquated existing language potentially. Um, Mr. Richards, if you know. Madam Chair, uh, we certainly can. Um, unfortunately, this endow acronym is used elsewhere in, in statute as the co-chair uh, or the Madam Chairman indicated this is existing language. Okay, further discussion on the bill? Question having been called, it's a roll call vote. You are voting to adopt this as a joint appropriations committee bill. It will be going to the House first. Uh, that's a predetermined one. Roll call vote. Members of the committee, the motion is on 24 LSO 053. Working draft 0 0.4 as amended. Representative Henderson. Aye. Representative Larson. Aye. Representative Sherwood. Aye. Representative Stith. Aye. Representative Walters. Aye. Representative Zwan and Sir Dave. Aye. Senator Anderson. No. Senator Garou. Aye. Senator Kinski. Aye. Senator Salazar. Aye. Co Chairman Nicholas. Aye. Madam Chairman. Aye. Members of the committee, the motion is adopted. <laughs> All right, that bill has passed. It is a joint appropriations committee, House Appropriations. Good luck with it in the session. Okay, with that committee members, we actually have some members of the public here to uh, speak with us on the Arboretum project. So we will allow those who wanna leave the room, uh, who don't wanna learn about the Arboretum project to step out. We'll take just a couple of minutes. This is not a break. You can just stand and stretch your legs as we rotate folks um, in and out of the room.
participate committee. We are we are not on break. We are currently live. We are live streaming. Please maintain decorum. We just are allowing the transition of relevant stakeholders in the room to pass through. Members of the Joint Appropriations Committee, you have Co-Chairman Nicholas handing out a proposed bill draft. This is the first time I am seeing it as well. It is 24 LSO 357 working draft six. I do think this is another effort by our good speaker who had to leave for another appointment this afternoon. Oh, he's back, wonderful. This feels like a setup. Feels like a setup. Feels like a setup. Speaker Summers, good to see you again. Members of the committee. Speaker Summers, as I indicated to the committee, this is the first time I'm seeing this bill draft as well. Could Chairman Nicholas told me there's folks in the room who wanted to maybe discuss it here just about an hour ago. So you're going to need to provide us a very high level, big picture overview of why we're taking Joint Appropriations Committee time during budget hearings to discuss this bill draft during our time and explain this bill to us. This has not been noticed to the public, is that correct? This bill draft, was this published? Is it on our meeting materials? No, we will not be voting on it today as a result of it not being published for the public to see. Perhaps we'll do it another day this week. But Speaker Summers, go ahead and proceed. So, Madam Chairman, you know, uh, thank you for, for letting me talk on this. It, it's really become, uh, it's oddly enough, uh, a site in, in near Cheyenne becoming a passion of me. But I was taken out there years ago um, while I was in the legislature on a weekend to walk through it, walk through the Arboretum, which is, an, which is a, basically an ARS site, which is a Department of Agriculture um, Agriculture Research Service site. And so during the Dust Bowl in the 30s, they created ARS sites around the country, and they created one in, in Wyoming, <clears throat> basically to look at both plains, grass research, and trees. And, and I don't know all the history, and I may get a little of it wrong, but it's really a unique site in that it's a living, it's a living history piece of, it's a living history moment, really, of, of research from bringing in trees from and plants from around the world to see what would grow in the high plains. As you remember in the 30s with the desert, you know, kind of the desertification or desertification of of the northern plains from from the uh, from all of the the lack of moisture, what they were trying to do is find plants that could hold soil, and uh, and when you go out there, it's just a, a real living test testament to those people that did that back then, and the history is amazing. The structures that exist there are amazing, and and I know that the town of Cheyenne is worked really hard to preserve it. Um, and I tried to figure out what would maybe make sense to get a partnership with the state. Um, and, and having done that, I, I brought in, in President Driscoll. Um, we took a tour out there with state parks and the city of Cheyenne. And we took a look at that site. And I think everybody that hadn't been there was so impressed with with really the history that is being preserved there. And it's everything from agricultural history of, of actually plains grass research to tree research. And, uh, and they've done a wonderful job of keeping it up for what the best they can. And uh, I'm gonna turn over the details to you. And, and uh, there's a wonderful book out there that shows the photos and does a wonderful job. But, I think it's a unique opportunity to create a historic site. The reason we're in front of appropriations is it was in TRW. Um, and I'm going to throw Chairman Nicholas under the bus. He kind of pulled the bill from them saying it needs more work. And and so the, the last opportunity we had after we did the work 
which was we, we did we had several several group meetings and and worked the bill and and so that's the bill before you but i'll turn it over to this young gal to the lady to his right yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> madam chairman i'm terrible with names I've, I've been around her now all summer and i still can't remember her name it's just the way it goes <laughs> <laughs> so in committee, we refer to everyone with their last names. Um, so please introduce yourself to the committee and who you're with. I am Jessica Fries. I am with, uh, representing the city of Cheyenne today. I am a horticulturist at the Cheyenne Botanic Gardens um, and have done uh, extensive research on the High Plains Arboretum over the past few years. Uh, the book that Representative Nicholas just passed out to you was a book I wrote about the history of the research station. Um, and so uh, that book focuses on the research that was done um, mainly in the 30s and 40s on finding plants that would grow in Wyoming's harsh climate. Um, in my role as a horticulturist at the Cheyenne Botanic Gardens, I also help to maintain the High Plains Arboretum in conjunction with our urban forestry department. There are um, over 800 trees in the Arboretum currently. Um, Almost 600 of them were planted prior to 1975, most of them between 1930s and 1950s. Um, so very historic trees that we're trying to preserve. There are also multiple historic buildings on the research station site, which were designed by a renowned Wyoming architect, William Du Bois, who was also um, and I'm sorry, I might be getting ahead of myself. I was just supposed to introduce myself, <laughs> but I'm with the city of Cheyenne. Uh, was getting a little carried away. I get very excited about this place. So um, that's why. You're doing great. Um, keep going. I may just take us back a little bit. There, you know, the public is watching um, as well. If you can, what is an arboretum? When was this arboretum created? Why was it created? And I think that's kind of been touched upon, but maybe in just a more real introductory fashion, because for some members of this committee and the public, they have no idea what we're talking about or what Speaker Summers and you have been doing all summer long. Mm -hmm. So that is just kind of helpful and, and you're wonderful at explaining it. Well, thank you, um, Madam Chairman. Uh, yes, absolutely. The word arboretum is not very well known in Wyoming for good reason. And uh, the reason why uh, arboretum is basically a garden of trees. Um, so the purpose of an arboretum is to have a collection of trees. Um, and as we all have seen, there aren't very many trees in Wyoming. So arboretum is kind of an unfamiliar term <laughs> in our state. Um, so that's one thing that makes this place really special. Um, the purpose, the reason why this station was started, it was funded by Congress in 1928 the United States Department of Agriculture was authorized to set up a research station uh, west of Cheyenne for the purpose of finding plants that could grow in Wyoming's climate. Um, as people were settling this area, they were bringing plants from out east, from Europe, and having a very hard time getting established here because a lot of those plants just didn't grow here. And so because of the harsh climate, they needed to really focus research on finding uh, vegetables, fruits that people could grow to have their own produce because, um, you know, back in the 30s, there wasn't refrigerated shipping. So if you wanted fresh produce, you had to grow it yourself. And um, they also were looking at ornamental plants just to make Wyoming a more beautiful place. So they looked at ornamental trees and ornamental shrubs. They also worked on flowers like chrysanthemums um, to, you know, just help beautify communities and make Wyoming feel more like home for people settling here. And then a third purpose of the re original research was shelter belt research. Um, we, we all are familiar with the high winds here in Wyoming, so they wanted to find ways to block the wind and, and make communities and homesteads um, a little more comfortable to live in. So those were kind of the three main focuses of the research when the station was first started. As uh, Speaker Summers mentioned, they also, um, in the 30s, had, there was a big interest in erosion control um, due to the um, the Dust Bowl and the, you know, farming practices were contributing to loss of topsoil. So they did actually do a lot of research on bringing in different types of grasses for erosion control. Um, in the 70s, the USDA decided to change the focus of the research to um, rangelands research. So the horticultural research, for the most part, was ended. Um, and then they started focusing on Wyoming's grasslands. And they looked at how grazing, um, is particularly stocking rates, affect our native grasses. Um, they also looked at 
trying to reclaim the prairies after disturbances due to mining um, and the best way to reestablish those prairies. Um, and so those, that research continues on today. The USDA still is doing the agricultural grasslands research and that grazing research that was began in the 70s still continues. So that's some of the longest rain, uh, ranging uh, grazing projects um, in the country. And so that continues to contribute to our agricultural industry and in helping ranchers know how to best uh, take care of their grasses and, and, um, and take care of their cattle at the same time. So um, the horticultural portion, um, when it ended in the 70s, a lot of those trees and shrubs uh, that were planted in the original arboretum portion of the station, looking for those ornamental uh, trees and shrubs to help beautify communities were pretty much just left to survive. And uh, there was very little irrigation and pruning uh, going on. They did try to keep the grass and weeds down around the trees. But other than that, those trees and shrubs that are still alive out there today have, have survived this climate. And so they've proven themselves to be tough enough uh, to, to live here. And so um, an exciting thing about this project is um, not only would we like to preserve that history of, you know, what they were able to find out about how to grow plants here in Wyoming, the architectural history, the agricultural history, but also we have this living collection of plants that have been tested in our climate. And so with um, help from the state to restore the historic greenhouse facilities, you know, we could um, better propagate those trees, that collection of trees and shrubs that we already have to make it more available for, you know, use around the state again, which was another part of the original purpose of the station was to grow trees and shrubs and distribute them around the state. And there's even some trees here on the grounds of the state capitol that were provided by that station. So um, it would, you know, the exciting part is preserving the history, but also the prospect of in, in the future going back to that original purpose of growing trees and shrubs for our state. When did it shut down? So the the, the horticultural research stopped in the 70s. They continued to use the greenhouses up until um, they, they were doing some carnation research for the commercial flower industry that continued into the 90s. Um, once that was completed, the, the greenhouses were pretty much just used by uh, station staff for you know, their own projects. And they were also you know, trying to propagate if there was you know, a certain plant in the Arboretum that was starting to fail, they'd take cuttings of it to try and replace it. So there was a little bit of that going on, but um, the using those greenhouse facilities had pretty much ended by the early 2000s. And now uh, the city of Cheyenne uses them for storing tools and, and uh, supplies, but we haven't actually been growing anything in the greenhouses since the uh, early 2000s. And how many buildings are on the property? So there, um, as part of this project, the USDA still uses, um, I think there's 12 buildings total, if I'm remembering off the top of my head, the USDA still uses some of them for offices and storage and uh, maintenance. Um, so as part of this proposed project, there is the greenhouse and lath house buildings, which were used for plant production, which are, have already been given by the USDA back to the city of Cheyenne. Um, there are four houses that were originally used for staff residences that the USDA no longer uses. When did they stop using them? That would have been, I think 2016 was when they officially shuttered them. Um, they were kind of used sparsely uh, in the early 2000s. Um, and then there's also the one building that was most recently used as a soils laboratory building um, up until the early 2000s. Um, I think that one has also been shuttered since about 2016, if I'm remembering co correctly. Um, that was originally a bunkhouse that was used for um, housing uh, single members of station staff, but then they um, kind of transitioned it into a laboratory building um, in about starting in the 30s um, into the 50s and 60s. I think by the 60s, it was pretty much a laboratory building. So those five buildings that are currently still under lease to the USDA as part of this project would be um, given to the project so that uh, they could be historically restored and, and used so who currently owns the land and the buildings? So the land uh, is a little over 2,000 acres, has always been owned by the city of Cheyenne. Um, as part of this bill in 1928, the city of Cheyenne leased those, or a little over 2,000 acres to the USDA for a 199 year lease. So that was beginning in 1928. So we haven't quite reached 100 of those 199 years yet. But in um, 2008, uh, 65 acres encompassing the Arboretum 
was taken out of that lease and returned to the city of Cheyenne. And then in 2016, the greenhouse and lath house buildings were returned to the city of Cheyenne. So the city of Cheyenne manages 65 of those acres. The remaining 2,000 is still under lease to the United States Department of Agriculture, but they would be willing to amend the lease to return those other buildings. And then also uh, this bill is proposing that 877 acres of the station be, would be leased to state parks uh, through the city of Cheyenne um, for the state historic site. Um, Representative Larson. Uh, I'm taking control of this committee. <laughs> Madam Chair and Representative Larson, um, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I could, I, I missed how many acres that the, the state parks. So the proposed historic site would be 877 acres. Um, that's encompassing all of the buildings and the uh, former research plots. And control back to you. All right. Speaker Summers, do you have an estimated cost to the state to take this project on? No, I do. Co Chairman Nicholas does. Co Chairman Nicholas, can you answer that question directly? Yeah, but um, let, let me just provide a little more background, current background. So, the various folks in around Cheyenne over the last couple of years have been trying to figure out what to do with this historic site. They don't have the money or the wherewithal to do anything with it other than maintain it and at a minimum. And it's slowly demolishing as it's just sitting there because they simply don't have the funds to do it. I am confident part of the roof is missing as of today. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so then the, they've created several, I've been on a working group and we've been working for four or five months um, to put together some type of a package um, with the, and we brought in state parks uh, and, and they, they are now doing a, um, their analysis, but, but which they do before they can accept and then take over any properties. And we're in the middle of that process. To culminate that process, um, it, it requires statutory action to turn this into a state historic site. I mean, that's so that's legislative action. So that's, that's, that's part of the steps that we're going through and that's part of this introduction to this committee um, to, to, get, to see if we can't get that off the ground. So, there, there are various phases to this. And, and so one of the concept, the concept that we've come up with with this community working group is to make it as least expensive as possible, but still preserve everything that we can to have buy-in from the community. And so the, the, the town or the city of Cheyenne has already agreed to have one-time full employee and, and other types of things to, so to um, on, a, you know, on an ongoing basis to help take care of the grounds um, and then we want to work with the UW and LCCC on a horticultural type component as we, as we bring um, the, the greenhouses back online. We also want to make it a destination site for, for the uh, um, off the interstate for, for a historic site. Once again, building this into a program that is, is, is as self-supportive as possible, um, but also um, preserve and develop the properties. And so that's, that's all in, in the larger game plan. If we wanted to go in and restore the current buildings today, and if we had a magic wand, it would be roughly about $6 million to do it. Um, the, but we said, look, that's not an easy thing to do. We need to get this off the ground first. And so that's, so the bill that you have in front of you has no appropriation in it. And so if we create a state park and then, uh, and we take those actions, then, then we'll have the discussion of how much funds we think is reasonable to get this off the ground um, and, and to review, because that was just a quick analysis by state parks to came up with that number. Um, and so we're, we're kind of taking baby steps as we're moving forward. But the first thing we have to do is, is basically um, create the designation. So that's, so that's how this is in front of this committee. And, and we all apologize because this is late in the game. The, the Travel and Rec did pass this and, and approved it. Um, but they, what they didn't do is, a, is pass on the final bill. They created a working group that Albert and I sit on. So we could refine the bill and, and kind of get all our ducks in a row. But I mean, we had the full support of that committee, at the, is my recollection. I think the vote was, um, of those present, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was unanimous. But that, that's just the background of how that got here today. All right, I'm going to redirect questions to Speaker Summers just so it doesn't get dysfunctional with the line of questioning with the chair. 
So, Speaker Summers, um, or or LSO, if in fact we designate it as a state historic site, are we then not responsible for it? And I know that's an open question because we can choose to demolish the building or we can choose to restore it, but it is now our obligation to make that decision and be responsible for that potential liability either way. Is that accurate, Speaker Summers? So Madam Chairman, I think you should bring state parks up and they can kind of go through their process and how they would envision the partnership working. And then some of those things about liability for buildings, they could probably speak to you better than I can. Questions of the speaker before we go to the agency? Representative Larson. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker Summers, is it your intent then um, that the ownership of the property is retained by the city of Cheyenne? Could you Madam Chairman, um, Representative Larson. So, state parks in the city of Cheyenne would work out an MOU, and it, it could include others in that MOU on how that facility would function and who would own what. And that's why I want state parks to come up because they can explain that better than I can. Fair, Madam Chair, follow follow up. Up. Fair enough, but I would, I would like your intent. So, Madam Chairman, my intent is to create a state historical site that is a partnership between the town of Cheyenne and state parks and remains a partnership between the two. We are a class one city. We are not a town. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> All right, thank you. With that, we're bringing state parks up. Welcome back, director. You can step in the middle of this for us. Madam Chairman. Senator Anderson. Madam Chairman, I have two questions. One is, where is this located around Cheyenne here? And are we still using the reservoir? It sounds like the reservoir was for Cheyenne drinking water. Are we still using that? Um, Madam Chairman, uh, yes. So the first question, the location, it's uh, directly west of uh, F.E. Warren Air Force Base off of Round Top Road. Um, and just north of Polo Ranch Road, so right after you cross the railroad tracks on Round Top Road. Um, the station runs almost all the, the, the full 2,000 acres runs almost all the way up to Horse Creek Road to the north. Um, um, but then, yeah, it's accessed from Round Top Road. Uh, second question about the, the reservoir. So historically, that reservoir held wastewater um, from the water filtration plant located on Round Top Hill. And so the, uh, whenever they needed to flush out the filters, that wastewater was held in the reservoir. And then that water was used for irrigation on the station. Um, a few years ago, the valve that lets water out of that reservoir broke and it's deep enough underground that BOPU, the Board of Public Utilities decided it wasn't worth fixing. So right now the that reservoir is actually used as extra storage space when North Crow Reservoir gets too full in the spring. So they can still run water into the reservoir. They're not using the water treatment plant anymore. So there's no water coming out of the plant anymore, but they do use it for overflow. And then right now how it's currently set up, there is no way to get the water back out of the reservoir. Um, I've spoken with with the Board of Public Utilities. And if we wanted to pump that water out in the future for irrigation purposes, again, we could, um, It would, but they haven't currently done anything to do that. We currently just tap into some raw water lines um, coming from Granite Reservoir for the irrigation on the, on the Arboretum. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Fries. It is quite close. I think it's only about an eight minute drive mm -hmm. about, it's, it's quite close. And it and it and I have visited it. It is pretty special. So I do appreciate this effort. Process is important. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Director, thank you for being here. If you could give us your thoughts about the consequences of us potentially passing this piece of legislation and 
making the state some way responsible after we designate it a state park. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Dave Glenn, Director of State Parks and Cultural Resources. And I will punt most of the questions to Nick Nealon, the Deputy Director, and his team. They've been working on this diligently on that committee that Representative Larson, Chairman Larson has, excuse me, Nicholas, has been, has been talking about. Uh, we are excited uh, to take this on. Potentially, the biggest fear we have is to take it on with no funding. Uh, if, if we do that, it's going to be worse than what it is now. We just don't, we don't have the resources to help with that. Everybody is aware of that, but I just wanted to put that out there for that. And with that, the rest, I would have Nick come up and with his team and talk maybe a little bit about our site criteria process and what the process we've gone through on that. That'd be great. Welcome back. Madam Chairman, <clears throat> Nick Nealon, Deputy Director of uh, State Parks and Cultural Resources. With me is uh, Christina Bird, our District Manager for the Southeastern Corner of the State, which would include uh, this Arboretum property, and Carly Ann Carruthers, who is the head of our planning section. Uh, Carly Ann is the one who ran the site criteria process. And before State Parks can take any new sites into the system, we have to go through a, uh, a legislatively mandated rule-defined site criteria process. Uh, typically, that process takes us anywhere from nine months to 12 months, maybe even a little bit longer. Uh, due to the shortened nature of the time frame to get this done, we, we push through it a little bit more quickly than we normally would. Uh, we have wrapped up the process with the exception of public comment, uh, and we continue to gather public comment. In fact, there's a, a, an event coming up on the 16th on the 16th of January to continue that process. So, as you know, through the legislative session, um, as long as this is alive, uh, we will continue to gather public comment to uh, make sure that everybody's on board with this. The uh, to answer one of the questions that came up earlier, uh, we are every, almost everything that we have, almost everything that we operate statewide is uh, under an MOU or a lease agreement. We own very, very little. Uh, all of our big water parks <laughs> are through the, our MOUs with the Bureau of Reclamation. We run Kirk Gowdy State Park already with a uh, lease agreement through the city of Cheyenne. Uh, and we anticipate that the Arboretum, should it go through, would be under a similar lease agreement. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have uh, about our process or how we've gotten to this point. I, I, we can talk a little bit more about the budget numbers if, if that's something you'd like to do as well. We would. So the, uh, Madam Chairman, the, uh, our estimates to operate the site are just short of $900,000 per, bi per biennium. That's about $438,000 in staffing costs and $442,000 in operating costs. And I think you have those numbers in front of you. So if I'm a little off, please forgive me. Uh, in addition to that- Madam Chair, may I interrupt for one moment, just for clarity? Representative Walters, yes, and it's getting harder for me to hear because of the massive winds. Thank you, Madam <laughs> Chair. Just want to clarify that approximate uh, 900,000 biennium or annually. That's... Uh, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Representative Walters, that's biennial. Co-Chairman Nicholas directed my attention to, as, as you answer these questions, to the handout. Yes, the one that says Wyo Parks in the top right corner. I think specifically looking at partner commitments and biennial costs. But let's but the public doesn't have that information either because it was just handed out to us. And we know we have lots of fans watching online. <laughs> at least I know. So if you could just walk through that and verbalize that for us who, who don't have the benefit of this really pretty handout. Right. Absolutely. Madam Chairman, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask Christina to go ahead and do that. She's the one who will be uh, overseeing the site if it would become a state historic site. Madam Chairman, uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, on the sheet that you have in front of you from Wyoming State Parks, you will see biennial costs of staffing in the amount of $438,000. Those biennial costs include a superintendent who will run and operate the site as well as the partnerships, um, an education specialist, to do the outreach 
from the University of Wyoming, as well as our community colleges around the state, and a maintenance tech who can help us maintain the 877 acres, not including the 65 acres of arboretum trees or arboreal trees. Our operating budget costs per biennium are looking at $442,000. And then you do have a section for initial site improvements, and that would include um, minor, um, minor repair, hazardous remediation, um, uh, the lath house, the greenhouse, the head house, so that we could allow the city of Cheyenne con to continue the good works that they are doing. Um, it's kind of a startup cost um, for that, that $6 million. There are additional costs to restore the other buildings that were used as residences that have been vacant since that 20, 2016 timeframe. Um, our site characteristics and our statewide impacts, you know, we would like to restore the structures on the site, uh, the lath house, the, the, the structures. We would like to have the um, Civilian Conservation Corps assets available for people to see because we did have two Conservation Corps camps located on the site. Um, we do have some opportunity to do some uh, tree work to allow the city of Cheyenne, um, uh, Laramie Conservation District to do some statewide nursery work to allow for um, the growth of trees. And then we do have some partner commitments. The city of Cheyenne, obviously as owner of the property would continue to do a long-term lease agreement with, um, with the state of Wyoming. Um, and then the budget request going into the city in July does include one full-time horticultural specialist or position to work on the trees in the Arboretum and the 65 acres. Uh, the United States Department of Agriculture remains on that property, and they do remain in some of the historic structures as well as the pasture land with their agri agricultural, uh, agricultural um, research. The fence repair and maintenance of those would be conjoined with uh, the United States uh, Department of Agriculture. The Friends of the Cheyenne Botanic Gardens have also committed to future potential um, for help with the Arboretum itself, that 65 acres. The Board of Public Utilities is working with us to, they would consider um, assets on the round top area where the water facilities for Cheyenne have been historically and have been moved off. Those things would get turned over to Wyoming State Parks um, with the reservoir as well so that we could use the reservoir potentially to help water those trees. State Forestry is one of our biggest state partners who would help us with some of our arboreal needs for the trees in conjunction with urban forestry with the city. So they would help us with the trees that are not in the Arboretum because as you recall from your visit out there, there are a lot of trees behind those homes um, that are going to be in need of pruning and they're gonna be in need of care as well. Um, and then they have committed $20,000 in federal funds a year for three years for the state historic site. And those federal funds would go towards, um, towards the care and maintenance of the trees of themselves. The Laramie County Conservation District has already started a tree inventory on the site. They're spending, um, they're spending quite a bit of money to understand what kind of trees they have on the site so that they can also partner with the state and the city of Cheyenne to um, help maintain and preserve those, those trees. And then should we be able to create a nursery or a seedling nursery, they would help the city and the state do that as well. Um, and then, of course, whatever kind of funding would come from the Laramie Con County Conservation District could be considered um, in those plans. The Girl Scouts of America have a Girl Scout camp on top of Round Top Hill, and it is utilized by our local Girl Scouts as well as, well as our statewide Girl Scouts for their events. And they sure could use our assistance um, as well as we could use their assistance with maintaining that section of, of, of property. And then, of course, one of our partners would be the Veterans National Cemetery, which is located right behind or below or to the south of, of that section of, uh, of the High Plains Research Station, and they would continue to be an active participant in improvements to that area. <clears throat> Veterans, Girl Scouts, and Trees. <laughs> as well bring some puppies along as well. <laughs> and then, of course, on the back of that particular sheet that we provided is some history for, for you to review on the importance, the statewide importance of the High Plains Grasslands Research Station. 
Well, sounds like a lot of work has been done by State Park, so thank you for that. Uh, very helpful information. Questions from the committee? Representative Zwanitzer. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. So as a visitor, and I pay a fee to come and see this site, what am I going to be privileged to see? Uh, we're, just drive around that little circle and, and look at the trees. Uh, are one of the homes going to be opened up and furnished? Uh, it, help me understand whatever the fee is to get in, uh, why it's worth making the trip out to look at it once it's open. Absolutely, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Zwanitzer, um, thank you for that question. We do plan to have an interpretive center located in one of the homes, and that interpretive center will talk to the history of water usage in the state. It will discuss the history of the site and its importance statewide, as well as allowing us to discuss the opportunity of the existing um, purpose of both the Arboretum and the United States um, Agricultural Station um, Grasslands Research. In addition to that, we do want some recreation opportunities available in the form of walking paths um, throughout the site because the site offers us a unique opportunity to have a living history exhibit and all of the wonderful trees that Ms. Fries was talking about. And so we have an opportunity to really, to really do some interpretive paths through that site to, to um, encourage people to use it both in their day-to-day -day, um, walking as well as um, come visit the site for the history. Uh, Senator Carew. Thank you, Madam Chair. So question on the your site criteria, and I know we still have a public hearing to go on the 16th, right? Where And where is that meeting going to be held? Madam Chair, Senator Carew, that's going to be at the Wyoming State Museum from 7 to 8 o'clock on the 16th of January. Follow up. Follow up. Beyond with... Understanding that's an important piece to this. Were the, was there anything else in the site criteria checklist that you went through that gave you pause with regard to this site? Uh, Madam Chairman, I'm going to ask uh, Carly Ann, who uh, led that process for us, to answer that question, if that's all right. Great. Hi. Madam Chair, Senator Grew, I would not say there was very much that gave us pause. Um, if anything, this has been a really unique site, and it's been incredible that we have about 13 partners who've consistently come to the table to help us develop everything you see in front of us. Um, so oftentimes, I would say we're getting trickier properties, um, things that people don't know how to manage. And instead, this is not unlike that. I think there's still, still some challenges there. But to have a whole body of people behind us willing to help to contribute to commit partnerships has been pretty impressive. Follow up? Yep. Follow up. So, and then just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing, going back to Representative Larson's question. When you did the site criteria, you're talking about the 877 acres that was discussed by Jessica. <laughs> Jessica um, that brought that up, but is that is that the site that you set out in your criteria? Yes, Madam Chair, Senator Grew, that is correct, that we um, looked at 877 acres out of that larger 2,000 acre USDA property. Well, City of Cheyenne owned USDA managed property. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Thank you. Just to follow up on the question from Representative Wanitzer, um, I think we all recognize that this is not going to be a for fee um, park because it, it, you know, it's not something that people are going to pay five bucks to go in and see. Uh, and, and it's a walking park, so you can pull up and walk around. So the the, the fees that will be charged will be for our parents, for instance, if we re, re redo a couple of the buildings um, so that you can have you can have a wedding out there, you can have parties, and, and the state parks deals with that on a regular basis at different locations. But to just to go and enjoy the trees, you just go park your car and walk around. It's not there won't be a, a fees to assess of that. It's it also has the ability to to have bike parks as part of it. Um, but there's there are just all and, and if we get some of the the greenhouse is put to, back together. You could literally have some really beautiful events out there that would, um, I, I think, have a, a draw that would help sustain part of the ongoing cost of operations. It's, it, it's, it's, it's has a lot of potential to be self-supporting as we do it, and and also to get a community foundation and all that kind of thing to to turn this into um, 
you know, a, a goodwill project for the for the state of Wyoming to preserve it historically. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chairman. Committee, as a reminder, I, we're not going to vote on this today because it's not published as part of our meeting materials for the public to consider and provide public comment on. That is proper standing committee process and consistent with rules, and that is what we will do. But so we're hearing discussion and learning more about it here today. Is there any other questions for State Parks, Speaker Summers, City of Cheyenne, expert horticulturist, Ms. Fries? Madam Chairman. I have Representative Sherwood over there, and then we'll go to Senator Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, going back to a question that uh, Representative Stith asked um, during State Parks budget, um, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, um, if you could give me some more insight on how um, this program may be used uh, to leverage federal grants to assist in the care or development of the site. Thank you. That was Rep Representative Walters, brilliant. Notice, notice, notice there. There are funds available in, in that one pot of funds. Is that true? Madam Chairman, yes. <clears throat> Madam Chairman, Representative uh, Sherwood. I, I'm not sure about uh, Land and Water Conservation Fund dollars. I know the city has actively shied away from using LWCO funds at the site in the past. It doesn't mean we couldn't in the future with the right type of project. Uh, and there are other funding sources available. One of the things that we've heard repeatedly from state forestry is that there are very few funds available to start a nursery, but once a nursery is up and running, there are a lot of funds to help expand and sustain that type of a project. So I think if we can get this going, considering all the partners we have and, and uh, a couple that Christina uh, do doesn't have on the list, uh, you know, we'd be working with the local, with the uh, University of Wyoming and some other uh, schools around the state as well. I think once we get, if we can get this up and running, it's going to snowball and grow very quickly. Senator Anderson. Uh, I'm looking at this, uh, uh, your budget it looks to me like this needs about an $8 million appropriation in it to get started. That's the 6 million one that would be the initial site improvement. And then the 442 and the 438 to operate annually. Is, is that correct? Do you, we need to have some money in this bill to kick this off? Madam, Madam Chairman, uh, Senator Anderson, in a, in a perfect world, yes, sir. All right, final questions from the committee. Co-Chairman Nicholas. I, well, I, let me just respond to the, um, Senator Anderson's discussion. The, 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 the plan, really, uh, that, we're, that we're working on is the idea that we're going to throw $10 million at this and get that passed through on a budget session are pretty dang slim. So that's why you don't see an appropriation in the bill. So I think it would be more realistic that if we could uh, have it designated, then we'll create a uh, probably in the part of the the, uh, the parks and rec agency. We'll do an interim study, go on and figure out exactly what the cost should be, develop a long term plan with the parks on how to fund it, and what the obligations would be, and, and what we can and can't do, um, because you know the, all all the, these are all shoot from the hip numbers, and we don't really know what they are. Um, so we want to pre we'll, we'll preserve it in its best fashion as we can with the help of the city between now and then, but the, I mean, we just want to be realistic about it. Um, and so we, we do, I do not envision sticking on that type of an appropriation because the bill wouldn't, wouldn't have any legs to start with. Um, so the, uh, and we want to make sure that we have buy-in by everybody before we get that far. Okay, further questions from the committee? So committee, I will we'll look at potentially adding this to our agenda next week or at another time if you're interested in taking a vote, but we'll make that decision later. Um, thank you for your time and attention and all your work on this project. It is, I think, a worthwhile effort and uh, I'm excited and appreciative of the work that you've done. So thank you. All right. Committee, Madam, Madam Chairman, just one final thing. I wanted to thank uh, the city and the park uh, and state parks for, for all their work as well. They've 
I think everybody recognizes that it's a great project. It's just how do we fit all the pieces together? So I just appreciate their effort. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. With that, anything, Mr. Richards? Madam Chairman, um, I believe we do have some uh, public scheduling items and then maybe some educational items, but uh, first the public scheduling items, um, we're, we're trying to avoid Sorry about that. We're trying to avoid uh, um, situations like uh, today and yesterday. So we have opportunities to pull in um, agencies um, that are available um, and, and not have any large breaks. With that in mind, um, we do feel that it's likely that you would be able to get out of here um, at a mid-afternoon timeline on Friday, if that was so desired. Um, if that is... Uh, desired by the committee, we would like to try to begin scheduling some callback agencies. And uh, again, I read these five um, to you yesterday, but we have the executive session on security issues. Um, we have the Department of Corrections, but the sponsor on that one or the requester on that one may not uh, require a callback or it could be a 15 minute, very short, I would I would say. Uh, the Department of Family Services, again, um, not speaking for the requester, but this seems to me like a 15 minute uh, callback as well. ETS, that's probably a longer callback. This is more of a, a philosophical um, discussion of the TRP approach. And then uh, matching funds update might be 20 minutes or so with uh, um, the energy authority. So um, the chairs have not approved any of those yet, but happy to um, take your direction privately or publicly on that. Um, in addition, um, all of those uh, activities can certainly be scheduled Wednesday or Thursday, as soon as we get, or, or Friday. Um, and then that tends to free up uh, next Monday. The committee can certainly work bills if you so desire. Um, you've heard from at least one organization that was a little reluctant um, on that local government bill, but you could start the budget bill, you could start state capital construction, you could um, you have already designated that um, ARPA would be delayed until Wednesday of that week. Um, but if, if you wanted more callbacks or to designate um, uh, specific bills um, other than the budget bill, if you, if you want to do the budget bill Monday, um, your staff will be here ready to start um, walking through agencies. Alternatively, you may want you know, to uh, consider moving the uh, agenda around some. Committee, what do you think about giving staff and... All the state agencies, the holiday. So, Madam Co-Chair, I, I, I was going to about propose the same suggestion. I, I think we can probably very easily not have to work on Monday and still get everything that we need to get done next week. That is my recommendation, Senator Salazar. Madam Chair. Yeah. Uh, uh, is, it, is it the chair's uh, thoughts that if we give... Monday off uh, to the folks, we could still be done with our business by Friday afternoon. Is that yes, your thoughts? That is correct. Then um, I would I would favor that. And it just depends on if, Chair. if many of you want more callbacks and how much work you want to give. Senator Kinski? Well, if the choice is between taking Monday off or getting out of here Friday, I know that if we take Monday off, we won't get out of here Friday. So I'll take Monday off. <laughs> All right. So, committee, I, th I think Co-Chair and I, in hearing your comments, that at this point in time, it will recognize Martin Luther King Day on Monday and make sure everyone is able to uh, have that holiday. We have some public comment in the room. I wanted to keep it brief. Uh, Richard Garrett, and um, uh, I'm board chairman for an organization called Healthy Wyoming. Uh, I just want to give the committee and the chairs a heads up that uh, our organization is looking forward to offering very brief, I hope, sub substantive and concise and precise comments Friday during the one hour 
uh, public comment period, but not to take up that whole hour by any means. Thank you and for that. And just as a heads up, it's simply in support of the Department of Health's budget request. Mm -hmm. That's primarily what we intend to appreciate that. <clears throat> appreciate that information. We look forward to hearing that comment and it being timely. As you just heard, we lost a day um, by choice. So we appreciate that. Committee, any final comments or any any final comments from Mr. Richards before we come back again at 8 a.m. tomorrow? So, so Don and, and Madam Co-Chair, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at um, our Friday. Um, I mean, pretty game and fishing will not take very long. And I think I've heard that they're ready to go. So we could probably fit them in either tomorrow or the next day. Um, whatever you think works for them or, and put them on notice, because I think they'll, they're ready to to uh, show up whenever we need to. I bet if we have them here mid-morning yeah. that we'd get them in before lunch. So tomorrow morning may look like today where we kind of have a power morning. And then I'm looking at the stable token commission. I'm wondering what we envision that is going to, how long that's going to take and what's the, do we know? Uh, who's presenting? Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Apollo, who is the, uh, um, Director. Executive director of that organization will be presenting. This is an unusual request. There's no question about that. The governor has no recommendation. I'm not aware of any forthcoming letter uh, from the governor. Um, however, um, the legislature created that legislation last year. They provided an appropriation, I believe, of around $550,000. Um, and I believe they, the uh, blockchain task force has been working with um, the Stable uh, Token Commission and has um, a request for funds. I don't, I think it could be uh, certainly reduced from an hour. And so uh, in terms of the, your, from Craig, uh, you envision that to be roughly an hour and a half? Uh, I do not. Um, we created that before the Craig met, and I think we can complete that in um, 30 to 45 minutes. Should we have that? So what I'm, I'm just trying to, it looks to me like we could be done by lunchtime. Uh, we could, but I do need some direction from on those five agencies, whether to um, schedule them or not schedule them. Um, and you, you don't have to do it publicly. I, I'm not, um, but we do need, you know, for example, the security uh, discussion mm -hmm. might be an hour. Um, Let's keep all that on Friday morning. Friday. Okay, well, let, let's, let's, We'll discuss that tomorrow and kind of in between times so we know we can kind of solidify our, our Friday as well. So committee, if you're catching what we're, where it's going, we'll have, I think, an early ending on Friday and then Monday off. Representative Larson. What it is. Okay. All right, with that, committee meeting is adjourned. Before we start circling the drain. <laughs>